Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I hope you've had a good virtual conference so far. In this slot, I'll be talking to you about my research on coercive control in children and the harms that that can cause, and also um, what sort of help children might need to recover from coercive control. As you can see, my email address um, is is down there, catsy at hope.ac.uk. Feel free to email me if you have any questions or would like me to send you copies of my papers. And also feel free to follow me on Twitter where I am quite active. So you certainly you certainly get your money's worth in following me on Twitter. So what is coercive control? Well, I think a metaphor is helpful to understand what it is. And my metaphor is that it is like a car hijacking like having a car stolen, except it's not the car that is hijacked, it's a person's life. So imagine that life is like driving a car and you as the driver decide what roads to follow, what paths to go down. And when we look for a romantic partner, we're looking for somebody to share the drive with us and make joint decisions with us about which roads to go down as a pair. But a coercive control perpetrator has no interest in sharing the drive. Instead, they come up to your car and at first they're so charming and so attentive that it seems like, yes, this will be a great person to share the journey with. And they get into your car and then after a while they start to suggest that they, that they really, really like you, but you're just not very good at driving. It would be so much better if you just let them drive. So you think, oh, maybe I should let them drive. And pretty soon they take taken over the driving seat of your life. They're making the decisions and you're in the passenger seat. And then the coercive control gets worse and worse and worse over the months until before you even realize what's happened, you are in the boot of the car and the perpetrator has driven off with your life, taking it into directions that you never wanted it to go. So coercive control based domestic violence is different from what we might call situational couple violence. Situational couple violence is violence that occurs during couple conflicts where verbal aggression escalates into physical violence, but the perpetrator doesn't have this broader desire to control and dominate their partner's life. They're not trying to drive off with the car of their partner's life. By contrast, coercive control is motivated by the perpetrator's goal of getting control of their victim's life and maintaining that control like permanently. So all of their abusive tactics, including any physical or sexual violence they might use, are all directed towards that goal. It's all, I'm the one in charge, do what I say or else. Coercive control based domestic violence is a very severe form of abuse. It's one of the most harmful things that a human being could do to another human being. So how can you tell when somebody's experiencing coercive control? Well, what you need to do is examine the extent to which the perpetrator has limited the victim's freedom to express themselves to set boundaries and stand up for themselves, to see their friends and family, to do activities independently, to have a life beyond the relationship. A person experiencing coercive control will feel they can't do any of that. They'll feel they can't do ordinary everyday things because the perpetrator will subject them to very negative consequences if they do. And those negative consequences might be physical violence, but they might be other things like verbal aggression or giving the silent treatment and, and sulking for days on end, which would be very distressing, or taking away more freedom or taking away more, more control over money. So whatever the negative consequence is, the perpetrator is giving the message, please me or you'll be punished. Evan Stark's book, coercive control, how men entrap women in personal life, argued that our responses to coercive control based domestic abuse, we call it domestic abuse in, in the UK, um, it's the same as domestic violence. He argued that our responses to coercive control are failing because they wrongly see domestic violence as discrete incidents or episodes of violence, as in, the domestic abuse took place on Tuesday between 11 and 11.15 p.m. as though it could be put into that discrete little window of time. And 
we're getting this wrong and virtually all domestic violence and research is based on this physical incident model. And this is wrong, it's unhelpful because it's overlooking the fact that coercive control perpetrators are using many other abusive tactics besides physical violence. They're using emotional abuse, monitoring, micro-regulation of day-to-day -day life, isolation and economic abuse. And they're doing this continuously. There's never really a time when they've stopped doing it. So victims and survivors are being repeatedly, constantly abused, even if there hasn't been an incident of physical violence for months, if ever. So this helps to explain behaviours in victims and survivors, which people outside the relationship might find difficult to understand, like why the victim would find it so very hard to break free. So this slide helps to explain a bit more about what goes on within coercive control. And you can see my terrible toolbox on the screen there. And that is like the perpetrator's toolbox of coercive control. Now, normally when we use a toolbox, we might be trying to do something like put up some shelves, but the perpetrator's tools are there to get control of another person's life and keep control of it permanently. And if you imagine that the hammer might be the verbal, emotional and psychological ab abuse and manipulation, including by sometimes being nice, which is part of the emotional and psychological abuse. If you imagine that the screwdriver is part of the control of time and space and movement and the micro-regulation of everyday life. By the way, when I say that being nice is part of the emotional and psychological abuse, what I mean is that if perpetrators were just horrible all day long, it, you would, they would push victims to a point where they would where they would really consider breaking free quickly. So the periods of being nice are, are put in by the perpetrator to stop the victim from getting to that point of having had enough, to give them false hope, to make them think that things are better now, or to make them think that things are not that bad, or that the, the bad period was almost in their imagination and things could, couldn't have been that bad because look how nice the perpetrator is being now. So it's very manipulative on behalf of the perpetrator. So we've also got the continual monitoring. We've got the rape and the sexual coerciveness and the reproductive coercion, which is making somebody have or not have a baby. Um, I mention rape and sexual coerciveness because nobody who's being subjected to coercive control can give free consent to any sexual activity because, of course, they're scared of what will happen if they say no to something. So at a minimum, it's very sexually coercive, but it could also be experienced as just being raped all the time. Then there's the economic abuse, which includes interfering with the victim's employment, preventing them from having money, refusing to contribute to bills, creating debts for which the victim is then liable to pay off, isolating them from sources of support, from their own children, from their own family members, parents, brothers, sisters, friends, isolating them from professionals who might be able to help them, manipulating others, including the children in the family, to upset and marginalise and disempower the victim, to surround them with people who won't take them seriously if they say what's going on, who, who think that the perpetrator, because of how manipulative the perpetrator is, that surround the victim with people who think that the perpetrator is wonderful and that the victim is mentally unstable. So the perpetrator will very carefully create that narrative that they're wonderful, but the victim is mentally unstable, is making things up, is a really difficult person to live with. So that if the victim were to reach out for help, there would be no help there. And then they also use legal or institutional means to threaten or harm or discredit the victim. So things like threatening to get them into trouble with social services and child welfare, threatening to call up and make a false claim that they're an abusive mother or threat like if they if the victim doesn't have secure immigration status, threatening to, to have them deported from the country. So using whatever means they can use to 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 keep that victim trapped and then we've got the physical violence and abuse which i've put at the bottom of the list because it always is the one that gets over talked about um, 
So that will include physical violence, but could also just include intimidation or threats of violence, not necessarily just against the victim, but also against their loved ones, their pets and their property. I heard of a case where a perpetrator took a, a big, sharp kitchen knife and cut up the, the backs of their fabric dining chairs in their home and slashed the backs of these dining chairs so that the fabric was hanging open. And although that wouldn't even register as a crime because it's their dining chairs and, you know, it wouldn't be a crime to cut them up. But what a threat that is for the victim. You know, look at what I have done to the dining chairs. Now imagine what I would do to you if you disobey me. So it's extremely threatening. So all of these things are part of the, the perpetrator's toolbox of coercive control. Some perpetrators don't use any physical violence. Stark and Hester in 2019 suggested that in perhaps as many as a third of coercive control cases, fear, constraints on autonomy, belittlement and other aspects of abuse create entrapment without any notable incident of violence. Similarly, Nivala looked at EU-wide data from the European Union's um, Violence Against Women survey and found that 45% of women who, ex who were experiencing high levels of control from a partner were not being subjected to any violence from this partner. And the other 55% who were experiencing high control were being subjected to violence. So it was almost half and half. You had some very controlling men who were not violent and some very controlling men who were violent. Day and Bowen in 2015 suggested that the non-violent perpetrators are actually the most clever and skillful abusers because they have mastered more covert and hard to identify ways of abusing that they're likely to get away with a lot more. So let's talk for a moment about the perpetrator. And I've put this image here of, of this very handsome man because perpetrators are often very handsome and they don't look like perpetrators at all. And I apologise to this man, whoever he is. I just found him on Google Images. Um, I'm sure he's not really a perpetrator, but I wanted to stress that that they can they can be the most handsome, hunky men possible and still be perpetrators. They can, you know, they can look, you know, they can look well educated, well groomed. You know, they can have a master's degree, a PhD, they can be in, in high status jobs. So they're very charming at the beginning of the relationship to gain their target's commitment, to get them committed to being with them. And they use nice and caring, I put in quote marks because it's not real niceness or care, but they use nice or caring, romantic or contrite behaviours from time to time to keep that victim locked into the relationship by giving them hope. But the fact that things are good in the relationship at the moment doesn't mean the abuse is over. It's all part of the abuse. They're very good at excusing, minimising, justifying and denying their behaviour, making everything that they've done seem much less than it was or denying that it happened at all. They can present as a very kind and caring person and they're often good at recruiting allies from among their family their friendship groups, their workplaces and communities, and they're often good at turning professionals involved with the family into their allies as well through careful manipulation. Coercive control is caused by the perpetrator themselves, not by the relationship. Perpetrators tend to be very self-centered and they often have a highly inflated sense of entitlement they often believe their needs come first and that their partner and children should make pleasing them their overriding priority. Coercive control, therefore, isn't being caused by a turbulent relationship, a toxic relationship, a, a bad dynamic between the partners. No, it is being caused by the perpetrator's deeply held belief systems, attitudes and expectations things that they held before the relationship even began. So the perpetrator's tendency to coercively control doesn't disappear when the relationship ends, it remains in the perpetrator. Put simply, the problem is in the perpetrator, not in the relationship. The terms fighting and arguing are misleading and inaccurate when it comes to coercive control because within coercive control, 
anything that looks like a fight or an argument is actually about the perpetrator trying to impose control on the victim and the victim resisting this, which is a very reasonable and psychologically healthy thing for the victim to do. Resistance may take the form of shouting at the perpetrator, screaming, using violence defensively or to fight back. This doesn't mean that they aren't a real victim. If they're experiencing coercive control, then they are a real victim, no matter what they're doing to resist or fight back. I heard a woman once say that she, she didn't think she could have been a real victim because she fought back, but of course she was. Perpetrators may seem angry. They may seem very angry. But this isn't because they have a problem with anger, because their problem isn't with anger. Their problem is their overly high sense of entitlement and their need to control. The reason why they're angry is because the victim is resisting their control. So they have a problem with control, with entitlement, not with anger. Perpetrators often use abusive behaviours, whether that's shouting or a nasty comment like you're so stupid or threats or violence itself to punish the victim for resisting their control. So they're using abuse to manipulate and belittle and frighten their victim into greater submission in the future. So Wes Marland and Kelly and Kelly and Sharp Jets highlight that coercive control takes away the victims and survivors freedom to say and do just ordinary everyday things and to meet their own needs without worry or fear. As perpetrators micro-regulate their victims' everyday behaviours, the victims' options and choices, their ability to decide anything for themselves gets smaller and smaller and smaller until really the only choice they're left with is what can I possibly do that won't upset the perpetrator? So this has a really negative psychological effect on people, you know, constraints on your freedom, your autonomy and your voice contribute to disempowerment, a loss of self, a loss of identity, a loss of confidence, self-esteem in victims and survivors. So when we're interacting with victims and survivors, it's so helpful to do anything we can, big or small, just even the most little things, to make them feel respected, that you respect them, to make them feel like they're worthwhile, that you see them as worthwhile, to make them feel as though they are skilled and capable and that you recognise that they are skilled and capable. All of this just helps to counter the perpetrator's coercive control because these are the opposite of the messages they've been getting from the perpetrator. So now I'm going to tell you more about my study on children and coercive control. And the key questions that I wanted to investigate are how are children who, you know, who have a coercive control perpetrating parent affected by living under that perpetrator's regime of coercive control, a regime that may or may not include physical violence? And what does the road to recovery look like for children and mothers who have experienced coercive control? I should say here that the um, research has shown that the, the vast majority of cases of coercive control are ones where the male, the father, has perpetrated against the, the woman, the mother. But there are some cases where it's the other way around. Um, so there can be cases where the mother is the perpetrator and the father is the victim. But I, I, that isn't covered in my study, so I won't be going into detail about that. But it is important to acknowledge that there are some male victims of coercive control out there too. And of course, it can also happen in relationships between a same sex couple as well. Anyhow, so what I did in my own research was I interviewed with 15 mothers and 15 children. The, the children were children of those mothers, so a mother and a child from the same family. The children were between 10 and 14 years old, with the exception of one 20 year old young man who also took part. Um, and he still lived with his mum. Um, I interviewed with nine girls and six boys. The perpetrators were the children's biological father or stepfather. And I contacted the, the participants through organisations like Women's Aid, which I guess is a kind of very similar service to Federation of, of Women's Shelters um, that, that, that you guys have. 
Um, and all the interviewees were living in the community at the time, so they weren't in a refuge, and they had all separated from perpetrators. And most of them have been separated for quite a long time by the time I interviewed them, so at least three years, but sometimes longer. So this is what I found. When children were living with a coercive controlling father, they, they told me that their father demanded high levels of attention from their mum at the expense of them, and they stopped mums and children from spending time together. So Marie, who was a mother, said, my daughter Leah used to want me to sit and brush her hair, but that wasn't allowed because he'd be jealous. He'd say things like, you spent enough attention on her, what about my attention? So this is what I was talking about before, about the over high entitlement, the belief that, that family life should be all about pleasing them. When mum was giving me attention, he would tell her to go over to him so she'd have to leave me to play by myself, said 10-year-old Shannon. So perpetrators' father's coercive control was limiting the amount of maternal attention that children could enjoy. I and mean, it was reducing the opportunities for fun and affection and, you know, just nice positive things in the home. And children were sad and annoyed and angry at these situations, very understandably. And I think that this was contributing to, to the, these feelings of, of being like angry or, or really withdrawn that we often see in children who've been through this. When perpetrators' fathers controlled mothers' movements outside the home, this also really restricted children's social lives, especially younger children who are more dependent on their mums to, to facilitate their access to the wider world, you know, by driving them around or walking with them. So when mums were isolated, children were also prevented from, from seeing wider family, peers, and doing extracurricular activities. One mother described how the kids couldn't have any friends round because he'd kick off or something. Kids' parties were another problem because he'd be accusing me of trying to get off, have sexual relations with one of the dads so parties were out of the question. We couldn't do any after school clubs because he insisted that I be back at a certain time every day. So it was like she, she had a curfew. She had to be back by 5 p.m. every day. And the after, and the, the after school club finished at six. And so she, the, the children couldn't do it. Me and the kids weren't allowed to go around and see their grandparents. So what you've got here is children who can't have their friends to their own home, can't go to the important social events among their peer group, like the birthday parties, who can't take part in after school clubs that their friends are doing, and who aren't even able to see their grandparents. So we've got here children living in the same isolated and lonely worlds as their mums, and the multiple benefits that children should have from positive experiences with grandparents or friends or after school clubs and all the good things that these things should be doing for children's social skills and confidence and development. Their fathers were denying them access to all those things. Extreme tactics for depriving the family of freedom, independent, in, independence and resources impacted on children as well as mums. So this is... Um, Eloise and her 20 year old son John who wanted to be interviewed together and they explained that he would tell us that we couldn't touch the food in the fridge that we weren't allowed to eat he'd lock us in the house a lot of the time so we couldn't get out he'd unplug the phone he'd take the power out in the hall because we've got an old electric box where you can take things out and that's it you've got no power he used to take an element out of the central heating so we'd have no heating He'd lock us in the house and go out. He'd take the modem so that John couldn't do his homework and I couldn't do my banking on the computer. So we were prisoners in a way. So these tactics highlight how some perpetrators' fathers directly and purposefully extend their coercive control over their children as well as their girlfriend or wife. You can see in this quote they're saying, this was happening to both of us. He was saying this to both of us. Many children had very limited freedom to just say and do normal age-appropriate things at home. 
they were constantly having to hold in and constrain their own behavior, the things that children naturally run around doing to comply with their dad's demands. When he came home from work, he would want to spend time with the children and then they were always his girls, very possessive. He used to say to our daughter Zoe, you're my little angel. But at the same time, they couldn't shout, they couldn't make noise, they couldn't be children around him unless it was on his terms. It was all right if he wanted to play with them, but at other times, it was like he wanted them to disappear. Some perpetrators' fathers' negative moods could dominate homes to such an extent that children and mothers were literally prevented from laughing and having fun. Laughter? We would have just been told to shut up. It was just a completely miserable experience. It was just angry and miserable and grumpy all the time. So there was no fun in the house, no laughter. Both children and mothers engaged in acts of resistance to the coercive control they were experiencing. Even if they didn't quite see it as resistance, that is what they were doing. Now, what they could do to resist really depended on the opportunities that they had under the particular regime of coercive control that the perpetrator had imposed. And resistance, because coercive control is an attack on normal everyday life and normal everyday freedom, resistance was also about finding ways to maintain elements of normal life where possible, and also to stay close to each other as mother and child where possible, which, as we've seen, perpetrators could stop, you know, by calling mothers away whenever they were trying to spend time with children. So Eloise and John, although they were often imprisoned in the home, when they could get out, they went out and we did things together. We went to the pictures, the movies, or we went shopping and we could just let our hair down and do what we wanted to do. So moments of experiencing autonomy, you know, the self-determination. We were going to the cinema two or three times a week to get out the house. And you might ask, well, how could they afford that? And it was because Eloise's own father, John's grandfather, was giving them the money to do that. And that was his way of helping. So that was an opportunity that they had under their particular regime of coercive control that they took. Other mothers wouldn't have had that opportunity because they wouldn't have had the money. When we would come back with shopping bags, sometimes we had to hide them because he would go mad that I'd spent money on John. So we used to throw the bags over the hedge into the garden so he wouldn't see them. So what may look like a bag of shopping is actually an act of defiance and resistance. Well, some days he would be out and me and mum would watch a movie and have some time together, which he wouldn't let us do when he was at home. And I used to help cook tea with my mum because I enjoy cooking. So we'd like help each other. And Katie's mum, Ruby, described how on those days when we were alone, we would snuggle up on the sofa and watch films together. And we always emotionally supported each other then. So this was their way of resisting. And so mothers and children were finding opportunities to promote each other's well-being and reduce the negative impacts of the domestic violence on them. And this was the case even when much of their lives were being overrun by the perpetrator's coercive control. So by defying the perpetrator's coercive control when possible, children and mothers were maintaining some sense of autonomy, you know, taking back the driving seat of their life just for short periods of time. And this was pre preventing the perpetrator from gaining that total control over them that he was seeking. So if you can highlight the ways that they resisted, which they may not even notice as resistance, they may not think of it as resistance, but if you can help them to see the ways that they were resisting, it helps them to recognize their strengths and to see that they were fighting this all along. They were not passive victims. So all of the participants in my study had eventually managed to break free and they had eventually managed to achieve safety, although it took quite a long time and perpetrators still tried to carry on abusing them afterwards. But eventually, a couple of years after separating, they were, most of them were in a pretty good space to start recovering and their lives were pretty safe. So I wanted to find out more about what kinds of support do child victims of coercive control need to recover and go on to have healthy and abuse-free lives? 
clearly these children need so much more than to be told violence is wrong. Some of them weren't even experiencing any violence, but what was happening to them was so much more than that, you know, all of the control. So I can't answer this question completely because mine's only one study, of course, but there were hints about the kinds of recovery needs that such children may have in my study. Firstly, it seemed that children had a need to see through the perpetrator's emotional abuse and manipulation. So 14 year old Grace described this journey she'd been on um, post separation. So she'd, after her parents had split up, she was mainly living with her mum, but she was having contact visits with her dad. And he would use these opportunities to be very emotionally manipulative. He would say to his daughter, your mum makes me cry and he paints such a bad picture of her and he blamed her and us for everything and he said he was on antidepressants because I wasn't seeing him often enough and I felt very small and bad. So this perpetrator you know is, is it's a it's what we could call a guilt trip he's he's trying to manipulate his daughter into seeing him more often and Grace describes how eventually a counsellor had helped her to, to understand what was going on and see through it. And this had been a really important moment in her recovery. And she'd actually gone from wanting to go and live with her dad to stop in contact with him, which is a huge transformation, you know, over a period of a couple of years. And that was because she was able to see through his manipulation. And she described this in her own words. I used to say sometimes years ago that I wanted to go and live with my dad. I stopped seeing him a couple of years ago. I'm closer to my mum now. I've spoken to two counsellors and one gave me these exercises to help me see what dad was doing, like all the emotional manipulation and how people around me were trying to help me. And that helped my confidence and it helped me to realise that I could talk to people. Children also really needed the message that it's okay to make mistakes because under their father's regime of coercive control, making mistakes was a, was a catastrophe and who knew what would happen. So they needed people to give them the message, it's okay to make mistakes and their mums were doing this for them. And it would be great if lots of people could do this for them. So a couple of examples from Eloise, John was painting the bathroom and he would never have done that before. The perpetrator wouldn't have let him and he dropped the paint and he thought I was going to go mad. So I come along and he says, you're probably not going to ask me to paint anymore, are you, mum? And I said, don't worry, John, I will. And then he said to me the other day, mum, will you teach me how to make pastry? Because he wants to learn. And I, my interpretation of this is that when after he dropped the paint and his mum didn't treat it as a disaster, it, it, it increased his confidence to then learn to do new things because he felt more confident that if he got it wrong as he was still learning, then there wouldn't be, it would be okay. And another mother described the same thing. Jack, my son, has so much more confidence now. He's like a different boy. And now he's more willing to do things because he knows he won't be criticized by me, by me like he was by his dad. And now he finds it so much easier to relax because there's not this atmosphere of tension anymore. And children also needed to feel safe and supported at home. And this was described by some of the different people who took part in my study about the new atmospheres of safety and supportiveness in their homes. Now we just have a laugh. And remember, laughing could often be banned under the perpetrator, but now they can have a laugh. And now we can just sit together and spend time together, which again is another thing that they were often stopped from doing. I'd say that we're considerate of each other, we're sensitive to each other's feelings and emotions, and I'd say we have fun. And 10-year-old Shannon said, the house that mum and I live in now may not be a mansion, but I love it here. It's nice and cosy and it's just better and it's the best. And finally, children had a need both for freedom and for a positive connection with others, their mum, their siblings, friends, they needed to have positive connections, but also their own freedom. Whereas under the perpetrator, 
their positive connections, as we saw, were kind of stopped. They couldn't see the people they wanted to see when they wanted to see them. And they had very little freedom. So part of children's needs for recovery is about reestablishing their positive connections with the good people around them and establishing their freedom. So my daughter and I have started going to storytelling events at the library and we've been to the hairdressers together and we've been out for a meal a couple of times, which is really, really nice. And this may sound very ordinary, but remember, none of that could really happen under coercive control. And this mother and, and, and daughter had been through such a hard time post-separation because the perpetrator was so violent and abusive post-separation that their being able to eventually go out like this was a big deal to them, very important. And then finally, 12-year-old Katie, we just love life at the moment. It's brought us all closer and we're all much happier than we were then because then we were all dull and we didn't like life much. And now we're all happy. We feel we can do anything we want. So I think what Katie's talking about is that under coercive control, it, it, your freedom is taken away to such an extent that you, you, there's no enjoyment in life and you feel like, like you're only half alive, like almost like you're living life in black and white when she says we were all dull, like they weren't really alive. But now it's like they're vibrant with life and colour because they feel they can do what they want to do. Their autonomy has come back. And that is important for children as well as mothers. Obviously, children don't have as much freedom and autonomy as adults because they, they have to do what they're told to an extent. But it's still really important for children to have some sense of autonomy. So restoring that to them is so important. OK, so that was the end of my presentation. And as I say, feel free to email me or follow me on Twitter. And I'd also like to let you know that you can email me if you want copies of any of my publications. And I'm very happy to send them to you. So just send me an email, catsy at hope.ac.uk. And also, I've got a book coming out soon, um, probably in the spring of 2021, Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives. So keep a look out for that in spring 2021. And I've also put lots of references. So if you want to do any further reading around this topic, um, then yeah, you've you've got you've got all those references. And um, yes, yeah, so that should definitely give you something to read if you want reading material. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that was informative. Thank you.